So our next talk is titled Criminal Clouds, uh, Rock Routers and Darknet DDoS Deals and it is given by Dr. Claudia Johnson. Claudia has been in the telecommunications market for quite some years, as she told me. And uh, recently she uh, joined our uh, sponsor Infoblox and um, what I understood from your talk is that uh, you will tell us as well something about security, but far more in the beginning. So you try to make us understanding how we can prevent from DDoS attacks actually happening by doing uh, nice threat intelligence, right? That's right. That's right. Great. So the stage is yours. Okay. First of all, I'd just like to say thank you to everybody that you're willing to listen to my American accent. Thank you for coming today. Um, a very provocative title, I will admit. I hope I can, um, you know, pique all of your interest, give you some information that's useful to you when you go back to your organization today, um, or tomorrow, I guess I should say, and make use of that. So first of all, just kind of an overview of what I wanted to talk to talk about today. Uh, first of all, a little bit of motivation. What are some of the challenges we're facing today inside of our organizations, outside in the, you know, big bad world of the cyber criminals and the criminal cloud, etc. Um, and then how we can address some of those problems, how we can help improve uh, the security posture of your organization and your neighbor's organization, potentially even your competitor's organization. Okay, so let's start off with the cyber kill chain. That's a model um, to try and understand how the cyber criminals work developed by Lockheed Martin back in 2011. It's not perfect. Uh, for one thing, it's addressing primarily advanced persistent threats, APTs, which is not the only kind of threat we have nowadays. We're seeing more and more, uh, let's say, gray zones, things that are not black and white in terms of who the malicious actors are and what they're trying to achieve. The state actors versus the criminals is no longer a category that's so easily identifiable. Um, and if you look at the cyber kill chain over on, the, on your left, um, you can see that it's, it's it, you know, it starts off with the simple things like um, reconnaissance, how can I get into somebody's network, where are their vulnerabilities, um, and ends with things like um, complete exploitation, complete achievement of the objectives, whether that be that the criminal wants to... Um, you know, exfiltrate some intellectual property or maybe just cause you some damage, whatever his goals may be. Now, whether we realize it or not, over on the right, on your right-hand side, our security systems that we put into place are often oriented consciously or probably even more subconsciously around those process steps in the cyber kill chain. For example, for reconnaissance, you might have something like vulnerability management. For something like weaponization and delivery, you have antivirus or endpoint protection. So there's a lot of different systems in there that are addressing this cyber kill chain, even though we may not call it as such. Then last but not least, there's something called security incident event management systems that were architected or designed initially to bring these different security systems together, bring those alarms together, do something like alarm correlation across vendors so that the security operations team and the security operations center can get a better picture of where their priorities to, should be. Now that all sounds good, but what's happened is, you know, a lot of these systems, especially like the SIEM systems, were designed many years ago, and it wasn't clear what would be happening in 2016. The amount, the energy, and the extent and magnitude of the criminal activity happening in the Internet is way, way more than we ever even dreamed of 10 years ago, which boils down to each of these security vendor systems uh, generating thousands, potentially depending on the size of the organization and depending on the kind of target it, it would be, for example, a large bank. It might even be millions of alarms on a daily basis. Um, these security systems tend to not be integrated very well with another. They're disparate, they're point solutions. So you might have each of these systems generating so many alarms that even one system for itself cannot be dealt with appropriately. And then you multiply that by, I don't know, typically I did a recent uh, questionnaire in, in a, a live audience like today, and I got the answer that most of their um, security systems were around, I think, 15 to 20 different vendor systems. I've worked with companies that have even more of that. So the, what, the picture I'm showing here with five different security systems is oversimplified. It's typically much, much more than that. 
They're all disparate, they're not integrated, they're all generating thousands of alarms. And the security and event management systems were not designed to handle that many alarms. Now, a lot of these alarms might be false positives. They look like it's something bad, but in fact, they're innocuous. That's complicating things. It's making things worse. It's making the uh, work and the daily challenge of the security analyst and the security operations center much, much more difficult. So, you know, what can we do? There's a number of things we can do. Obviously, the integrating the security systems is one thing. Um, what are we going to do about the security staff, though? Security staff are hard to find nowadays. Everybody's talking about it. Um, right now, we have a situation where, you know, each of these vendor systems may need a, a dedicated expert just for that vendor. Because nobody, because uh, it requires that many skills to install, maintain, configure the system, not even to mention understand all those alarms that are being generated, whether they're real, whether they can be ignored, whether they're secondary, or whether they're really showing something that I need to deal with right now. Uh, one other challenge, I have the word silos up there as a, as a, as a buzzword, um, is, is the fact that you've got a network team in one part of the organization and a security team in another part of the organization. Now, if it's a really small company, maybe they're all part of the same team. But I f personally find that to be more the exception. The rule is more, there are two disparate teams. The network guy reports into his line of management. The security guy reports into his line of management. Their managers may even report into different managers. In any case, these teams have a different set of goals, a different set of KPIs. Now, somebody who's on the security team, if, there, if there's an incident that is happening or is about to happen, he needs some of the information that that network guy has. That is a problem that we have. So the security guys, just to kind of, I'm still talking about the points on the last slide, actually. So the security guys are saying to themselves, we need something really fancy, something powerful, it's maybe something kind of sexy. In any case, something that I can touch and it's fast, it works, it gets me to where I want to go quickly. I don't have to spend a whole lot of time fixing things. But what they really get is a bunch of individual parts that don't always work together. Um, so to just kind of throw in some more words in here, you know, how do I prioritize events? I'm not going to get that with the security systems of today. On the contrary, it's becoming more and more challenging. No visibility. What is really going on in my network? I've got a next generation endpoint protection. I've got a next generation firewall. I've got intrusion detection, intrusion prevention. But do I really know what's going on in my network? Maybe not. Um, Lack of vendor, vendor integration, I talked about that before, that the key word here or the uh, buzzword there is, is ecosystems. That's the, the, the positive part of that. How do I drive more in vendor integration? Um, all of this resulting, for example, especially in the case of the uh, disparate um, network and security teams in manual processes. You know, I hand somebody a piece of paper, he calls so-and-so, they call somebody else, they say, no, 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 that Excel table with those IP addresses, that's outdated, you've got to call Mark over there. He's got a more updated file because he just did some updates in his network. Manual processes slow things down. That's just the opposite of what security teams today need in order to fight this increasingly sophisticated, hungry, cyber criminal uh, animal out there. So let me just talk about that very well-organized cyber gang. Now, this is a simplistic model. It doesn't describe all cyber gangs, but it's definitely um, portraying a trend that we're seeing taking place. A trend that's saying that, you know, it, get as many machines out there infected as possible, and I want a botnet, because botnets are very, very useful. So if you look up at the top left, centraladministration.com, the criminals need an IT infrastructure, just like you and me. They need something like a cloud, a criminal cloud. They need to be able to have a hosting environment where they can exchange files. They need to send emails to one another. They have a division of labor. There's different people that are addressing different tasks within the organization. Very tight, small organization compared to probably most of the uh, employers that you have. However, uh, there's definitely a lot of money behind it, a lot of energy, a lot of resources. Um, maliciouscoder.com. 
uh, you know, there's, a, there's basically a team of software engineers developing a malicious code based on common vulnerabilities. Things like Windows, where you know it's, there's a lot of machines out there leveraging this software, or popular open source software. They're going to be developing code to exploit those vulnerabilities with the task, with the business task, or with the organization task of getting as many machines out there infected as possible. And this is where it diverges from that cyber kill chain that I talked about before. We're not just talking about infiltrating a single organization with a small set of actors. We're talking about a large-scale organization leveraging popular tools to get something like a botnet going. Rapper.com. Now, that's not musicians. These are people that package that malware. And the interesting thing there is there's a lot of energy being put into that. One reason why is because the malicious coder is very well paid in the white hat world and in the black, black hat world. So next to the head of the cyber gang, he might be the most well paid guy. Now, if the cyber gang can avoid those costs and just grab some malware from five years ago, and have my really cool wrapper over here repackage it, that's worth it from a business point of view for him. And that's what he'll do. And we're seeing that. Malware from five or ten years ago, repackaged and going right by the antivirus software. Now once it's, the malware's been developed, it's been packaged, then the next step, um, distributor.com, is to get it out there, get it to as many machines as possible. Email campaigns via botnets, spam bots, or potentially infecting very popular websites to get as many uh, machines infected as possible. Now, I do say machines. A couple months ago, I might have said users. Let's get as many users infected as possible. Now I would say machines. It's no longer the laptops up there. It's also the CT CCTV cameras and the rogue routers. I think that the awareness for that's really changed in September of this year. Does anybody want to venture what happened in September of 2016 to change that? Okay, uh, maybe if I say October of 2016, would that help? No. Okay, September 2016, there's a security journalist named Brian Krebs. Um, he actually, and that's where DDoS deals in Darknet uh, comes out. DDoS, distributed denial of service, was being sold in Darknet for very low prices. I think you could get in there for like $20, $30 for an hour's worth of a DDoS attack. Um, you didn't need to know anything about the technology, you just needed to know how to get into the Darknet, that's it. Now, he published some information on that, there were some vengeful actions from malicious actors. Um, and the interesting thing is, up until September 2016, the largest DDoS attack was something like 400 plus gigabits a second. The, last, the largest known DDoS attack, I might add. Now, Brian Krebs, in September of 2016, was hit by 630 gigabits a second. That's a lot bigger. One month later, one month later, there was a DDoS attack on the company Dyne, maybe, maybe you heard about it, of six, over a terabit a second. That's like twice the previous size in one month. This is all leveraging Internet of Things. Rogue routers, CCTV cameras that have been compromised. Okay, so let me go back to the roles here. I was left off at distributors. The next thing that has to happen, I've got all these machines infected, including the CCTV cameras and everything else. Now the cyber gang has to make sure that they maintain their investment. So they've got something called command and control that makes sure that the machines that have been infected stay infected. It's that simple. That means no anti-malware updates, no operating system updates, and potentially downloading further malware because the machine is not completely in their control yet. It's infected, it's weakened, but it's not completely in their control. So command and control, important topic. So, and the end goal is the botnet. So I talked about Krebs, I talked about Mirai, or Mirai is the category, it's not even a one botnet, it's many, many, many botnets today that hit the company Dyn. Are any of you guys Netflix customers? Yes, finally I got some hands, thank you. Um, that's how I noticed it, the, the Dyn outage. Uh, Dyn is a DNS provider, Netflix is a customer of theirs. 
when the Dine DDoS attack was taking place of over a terabit a second, Netflix was one of many high-profile customers that went down. PayPal was another large customer. Botnet. So everybody associates botnets with uh, DDoS, which is correct. But I would like to add here that it's also at the same time slowly but surely becoming the Swiss army knife of the cyber criminals. For example, we're seeing increasing amount of advanced persistent threats be hiding behind botnets. Now, 2011, which is not all that long ago, uh, the cyber kill chain model from Lockheed Martin, they were seeing advanced persistent threats were individual or a small uh, number of state actors going, out, going after one particular organization. What we're seeing in 2016 is they're hiding themselves behind botnets. It's so much harder to detect them when they're hiding behind some innocuous website that just had been infected. It's not really an infectious domain, infected domain. It's just a, maybe one machine behind that domain that's been infected. So it makes it that much harder for threat intelligence, finally I'm using the word threat intelligence, to come up with those kind of names on blacklists. You want to be able to block or at least slow down traffic coming from certain domains. I've talked a little bit here about the different domain names, centraladministration.com, botnets.com, distributors.com, wrappers.com. What I'm, try I'm trying to make the point also that domain names are the basis for the communication of all of the internet. Now, you guys all know that you're all techies, you all come from service providers, but maybe it's not always 100% clear in your security strategy that the criminals need that too. Maybe you can share your joke with me later, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> so you need to be thinking about how, you know, can I leverage domain names to catch, see, and stop these guys. And it's non-trivial, because they know this too, obviously, and they have all sorts of techniques to obfuscate their domain names. For example, domain generation algorithm, generating inside of the malware thousands of domain names of which they may use just one when they're communicating with command and control. For example, fast flux, changing IP addresses on the, ad on the order of minutes. So that even if you've got the IP address behind a domain name, that does not mean you're going to be able to stop them. They'll switch to another IP address before you look twice. So what about... Uh, Threat intelligence, there's a new buzzword out there, actionable intelligence. I don't want to go into too much detail on this slide, just briefly uh, to give some context around that. Threat intelligence is obvious. That's information about what the malicious actors are doing, what um, you know, IP addresses, what domain names they're hiding behind, how to figure out the domain name they're going to be hiding behind in an hour's time, in two hours' time, in three days, in a month's time. Uh, actionable threat intelligence, or actionable intelligence as it's called, is that kind of intelligence that not only tells you what they're doing, but it gives you information on what you need to do, the actions you need to take to mitigate or to stop that in your network. Now, actionable th network intelligence is the slogan of Infoblox, the company I work for. So Infoblox is a DNS provider. I've talked a little bit about domain names at the beginning, Purposely not just using, using the term DNS, because I want to emphasize that it's really a basis for communication and not just a protocol. Combine that with threat intelligence, and you've got a really powerful tool to accompany you across the vendor space and across the cyber kill chain space. Because threat intelligence and domain names are used over the entire chain and across all vendors. Actionable network intelligence will give you the who, where, what, and why. If you use it in the right way, it'll improve your efficiency and reduce your risk. So here I just wanted to uh, emphasize DDI, DNS, DHCP, and IP address management. So DNS is, you know, the obvious 
thing. It's the protocols, the domain names. DHCP is what you need when you're allocating new IP addresses, new users coming online, new subscribers uh, joining the network. And then IP address management in your internal network, at least, is what your network team might be doing to make sure that they have a very clear uh, association between which IP addresses have been already been given, what devices they belong to, or which subnet network they belong to, whatever. Um, now, DDI is uh, an industry um, of which Infoblox is the market leader, of course, otherwise I wouldn't be talking about it, um, where we're really trying to improve the efficiency of the network teams. And this has worked really well for many, many years, but what we're seeing now with the security activity, you know, getting to a point where it's, it's becoming almost impossible to stay ahead of the game, uh, is that this efficiency in the network team can be taken over to the security team. Last week I was at a meeting and a colleague told me, Claudia, the network guys that use GDI at customer X, they are so fed up with their security colleagues, they're always on their back. So he told me, I just gave them my credentials. And you know what? He's not on my back anymore. So this is something that I think that people that are in security teams, I don't know if you are, maybe you're in the network teams, it doesn't matter. If you're in the network team, think about talking to your security colleagues about the kind of network information that they could use that would help them in their daily jobs. If you're in the security team, talk to the network guys. Do you use a DDI tool? If so, can I get access? That will really improve things. Um, I already talked a little bit about DNS security, how domain names, domain generation algorithms, those kinds of things. Um, we need to get further ahead in the game in order to, if we're going to le leverage blacklists at all, they have to be up to date. They have to include this kind of intelligence around what the cyber gangs are using now in 2016. Even six months ago, th the game was completely different. Ecosystem, we need to... As a community, both as buyers and as sellers, we need to get the security systems better integrated together. I'm working for a vendor that's driving that actively. That's one of the reasons why I joined Infoblox. You as buyers need to ask your security vendors, what other systems do you integrate with? Are they on my list of vendors? If they are, talk to them about how you can use that to improve your own security posture. If it's not on your list of vendors, Ask them if they do that integration. Oh, you know, really try and get that awareness in the security vendor com community going. For me as a buyer, security ecosystem is important. That will get that whole movement, uh, get more energy behind it, more market awareness behind it. I think that's really important in order to get that whole topic of security ecosystem in a more positive space. The criminals don't need to worry about that. They're well integrated. They might be competing really hard with each other, but their problems are not within their organization. So I talked about DDI, I talked about uh, ecosystem and DNS security. The only other thing I wanted to mention briefly was also to, to threat intelligence. So threat intelligence, D DGA, that's really important. Um, and one little thing I wanted to add was Infoblox bought a threat intelligence vendor that was one of the top five up until February of 2016 and the top five in the independent threat intelligence vendors. Um, they now belong to Infoblox. We have integrated that tightly into our system. If you're interested in what we have, come to our stand later. I think it's, uh, when you go upstairs, it's over on the right-hand side. Uh, I, I think uh, Alexander here uh, will be up at the stand. Uh, I'll be up there after I'm done the talk as well. And... Um, I shouldn't jump ahead yet, but I have one more thing I want to add to that at the end. So, just one more thing. We talk, I mentioned the Netflix. There's a couple of you that have Netflix, if I remember correctly, that was hit by the, the Dyne attacks. Um, and just very briefly mention uh, how at least Netflix or some of the other impacted customers, what they could have done. And it's something that's really simple and it just seems like a no-brainer. Why shouldn't I mention that briefly today? So... Um, the, cu the big customers that leverage Dyn, and Dyn's a good product. I don't want to say anything negative about that. The thing is, we didn't realize, well, I didn't realize, I'm assuming you didn't realize either up until a few months ago, that a terabit a second attack on a, on a DNS provider was even, you know, so likely, right? So um, if, you're, if you're a customer of Dyn and your customers can't get to www.netflix.com or PayPal, or whatever it is, because the DNS cannot be resolved, because the DNS provider is down. 
then a very simple way to mitigate that threat is to have a second authoritative provider, on-premise, for example. Last week, I was at a user group meeting of Infoblox in London, and there was a guy in there who um, proposed such an architecture to his company uh, a year ago. They implemented that. I think they thought he was crazy. You know, he's being extra careful. Um, and then after the Dyn attack, they were the only, one of the few, I think it might have even been the only, but I, don't quote me on that one, so I'm going to be careful and say, one of the few Dyn customers that was re not impacted at all by the outage. So some senior manager at Dyn, I think it was the CTO, called him. How did you do that? That was a really cool success story. So I don't know how many of you are, you know, part of a DNS provider organization or maybe a DNS provider, but that's something to think about maybe at least also from your customer's point of view. Maybe you're a customer of a DNS provider and you need to make sure that your DNS stays up. You have mission critical, business critical uh, information that needs to be reached by the public internet. So then back to the cyber kill chain, disrupting the cyber kill chain. The whole DNS space, domain name and a threat intelligence space is relevant from the beginning, whether it be reconnaissance recognizing, for example, the online tools that will do a vulnerability scan to the very end, incident response, I've been breached. I have to do public disclosure with GDPR, it's going to be a requirement in the EU. I have to disclose when I've been breached if it's over a certain amount. What am I going to do then? What am I going to tell law enforcement? What about the forensics? Do I know what they were after? Do I know if they actually got what they were out, set out to get? Threat intelligence will help you there, as will DDI. DDI will give you this also bit of history around who has been using which IP address at one particular point in time, which device, which network. Now, I mentioned uh, entropy and machine learning in my uh, abstract. Let me at least bring it in at the end here, or close to the end here. Entropy is, is one of many of about five or six different tools we use to detect uh, domain generation algorithms. And it's actually low entropy. So what you're looking for is, and if, if you do look at our threat intelligence tool, like I said, I'm, I'm happy to uh, provide you a demo on that one. It's funny because even as a, as a uh, non-machine learning um, creature, you can recognize these kinds of domain names fairly easily. For example, they'll start with a digit. And they'll all have, be followed with nine characters. And then maybe the same domain name ending. So there's a bunch of different characteristics like that that you can be used to detect uh, obviously malicious domain names. Some random set of 10 characters, who in their right mind is going to be using domain names like that? It's not impossible, but it's highly unlikely. Machine learning is what's used to tie these different criteria together, whether it be entropy, whether it be lexica, whether it be something else around the domain names that will give you that level of accuracy that you need. So just to kind of uh, finish off here, security operations, network operations, um, need to try and work together more closely. Infoblox would like to help you on that journey. It's a piece of the network team that ties in very well with the needs, with the requirements of this uh, security team. So think about, if you're an Infobox customer uh, and you're a network guy, thinking about, think about talking to your security colleague, giving him access maybe, showing him what he can do with that. If you don't have Infoblox, regardless of whether you work for the network or the security team, come to our stand and get a closer picture. There's, uh, we can also do a demo for you, for example, of a data, data exfiltration. Or we can do a demo of the dossier tool where you can research different domain names, IP addresses, URLs to see what kind of threat is behind there. While, while I'm at the stand, there's one more comment I wanted to make there. We have some really nice chocolate there. So if you, if you want to, first come, first serve, if you get to the stand before it's all gone and you watch a demo, you'll get a nice bar of chocolate. And the other thing you might want to get besides a demo is a packet capture. So just a one hour snapshot of what's the kind of traffic that's been going over your DNS server, send it to us in a PCAP file, we'll do a threat intelligence analysis of that and give you a picture of what's going on in your network. So. Thank you. Thank you.
I think we have again time for two questions. Anyone? No, then maybe I have a question. Uh, what are the ma machine learning techniques you're actually using? Can you give a brief insight? Yeah, so for our, uh, we have like a data exfiltration tool. And, um, you know, it's a popular way to exfiltrate data over DNS because port 53 is always open. So you don't have to worry about it, you know, um, being blocked or anything. And there's, you know, there's next generation firewalls and everything out there, but they tend to, you know, detect more popular tools like, um, you know, the ones that you can get online or whatever. Whereas if a really clever hacker's out there, he might just figure out a way to exfiltrate the data that is not, you know, I don't want to say zero day because it's not really zero day, but it's kind of like zero day in the sense that it's not a known uh, attack vector. And we have a tool called Threat Insight that leverages machine intelligence together with things like entropy, lexica, and it's the machine learning piece tunes that. So it takes a set of known data, you know, where you've got, you know, like A is malicious, B is, is, is okay. And then you, you take all those parameters and test them through obviously more than just two data sets, many, many, many data sets. And it uses it to tune uh, the five criteria along with um, anomaly scoring hmm. to give you a, a, it's basically to reduce false positives and get a better accuracy. Okay. Thank you.